The Passion of the Christ, it's perhaps the most emotional, heartbreaking, and humbling story ever told. And yet somehow, this account of despair and defeat was transformed into one of glory and triumph. Today, Christians the world over see the crucifixion of Jesus as the beginning of the most significant event in history. How did this amazing transformation come about? The answer lies somewhere in the lives of Christianity's founding fathers. Twelve ordinary men who followed Jesus in life, witnessed his horrific death, and experienced firsthand the greatest miracle the world has ever known. What happened to transform these men into a force so powerful it would change the world forever? Join us as we take a fascinating journey into the marvels, mysteries, and long-forgotten traditions surrounding the Apostles of Christ and find out how the world was changed forever by 12 ordinary men. Your host for this investigation into the Twelve Apostles is a nationally known speaker, television host, and the president of a national broadcast and cable television group. He's also the former president of the National Religious Broadcasters Association. Here is Jerry Rose. For thousands of years, they've been memorialized in paintings, sculptures, and religious icons. In fact, next to Jesus and the Virgin Mary, their faces have probably been depicted more often than any other people in the history of mankind. I'm speaking, of course, of the Twelve Apostles. For many, the mere mention of these chosen men of God conjures up images of pious saints in stained glass windows. They seem to have lived on a different spiritual plane than most of us humans, unreachable and untouchable. But is this actually the case? Have new discoveries made it possible to uncover the lost histories of the men Jesus chose? Can we now know what the apostles were really like? What amazing things did they experience? And what was their true source of power? Our search for answers begins with the fascinating but easily overlooked clues hidden in the most familiar places, the gospel stories themselves. As individuals, they were completely unremarkable, middle class at best. They came from all walks of life, fishermen, a tax collector, even a militant political rebel. But drawn together by the Messiah himself, this unlikely band of brothers would change the world. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, Thomas, James the Lesser, Philip, Nathaniel, Jude Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Matthias, the man who took the place of Judas Iscariot. Even today, their names are familiar in every corner of the globe, and some 2,000 years ago, they were familiar to each other as well. People often assume that before they were chosen by Jesus, the 12 apostles didn't know each other, but nothing could be further from the truth. There were two sets, perhaps three sets of brothers among the 12 men. There was Andrew and Peter, the sons of the fisherman Jonas, James and John, sons of the fisherman Zebedee, and also Matthew Levi and his brother Little James, or James the Less as he's sometimes called, who were sons of Alphaeus. Also interesting is the fact that James and John and Matthew Levi and his brother James were kinsmen of Jesus, possibly even first cousins. Before they became followers of Jesus, the Bible tells us that there were business relationships amongst the Twelve. Peter and Andrew were partners in the fishing business with James and John. The Bible also indicates that Thomas, Nathaniel, and Philip may have been fishermen in the same geographic region. So they probably all knew each other for many years before they met Christ. But the men who became the apostles had much more in common than family or business relations. They were all searching for something, or more specifically, someone, the Jewish Messiah, a man they believed would free them from the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. Rome was seen as just another overlord who's done it to us again, and uh, here we are again uh, being oppressed as the people of God. 
Roman occupation was onerous enough as it was, but they liked to flaunt it. They would plant their standard wherever they went. Of course, Jews went berserk because for one thing, they're monotheists, they worship only one God, and this is a symbol of a pagan deity. So that was definitely a bridge too far. In spite of the hated Roman occupation, there was hope among the Jewish people. Not long before Jesus came into the scene, a fiery prophet known as John the Baptist brought a message to the Jewish people. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, he said. The Messiah is coming. For hundreds of years, the Old Testament scriptures had told the Jews to watch for the Messiah who would save God's people and point the way to salvation. And so the apostles had undoubtedly heard about him from the time they were little boys. And in fact, the Bible tells us many of them were actively looking for this Savior to appear. In spite of their common interest in finding the Messiah, none of the disciples were considered to be religious leaders. In fact, some of them operated so far on the fringes of society that they were in many ways considered outcasts. The gathering of the Twelve began with a very public acknowledgement of Jesus by John the Baptist. When Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, the prophet sees Jesus approaching and uses a highly significant religious image to identify him. He calls him the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist also called him the Son of God, which to some in the crowd might have suggested Davidic Messiah, the Anointed One, the man we've been looking for. And among those who heard John the Baptist's testimony was a fisherman and follower of John the Baptist named Andrew. When he heard what John the Baptist said, he became a follower of Jesus. And shortly thereafter, he introduced his brother, Peter, to Jesus. Shortly after meeting the two fishermen, Jesus caused them to catch a miraculously large haul of fish. With Peter and Andrew still reeling from their unexplainable catch, Jesus asked them to become his followers and said he would make them fishers of men. It's interesting that just after Jesus miraculously gave Andrew and Peter the most successful day of fishing that they probably had ever had, that he asked them to leave their profession and follow him. Of course, he knew that he would make them even more effective at fishing for people. Jesus' primary message was about the kingdom of God. He wanted his followers clearly to understand that the kingdom of God is not about military triumph, but about repentance and surrendered hearts. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It didn't take long for the word to spread. We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. But was Jesus the kind of Messiah that the Jews had been waiting for? In the minds of the apostles, the Messiah would be more than just a political leader. He would be a liberator who was willing to stand up against the oppression of the Romans and free the Jewish people. So the apostles were looking for a triumphant hero, not a suffering savior. For a time, it appeared the apostles had found just what they were looking for. Everywhere he went, Jesus preached to larger and larger crowds. He performed astounding miracles and spoke with such wisdom and authority that many put their faith in him. But as the crowds increased, so did the intensity of Jesus' message. He told his followers that the Messiah would have to suffer and die and be raised on the third day. It was a difficult and confusing message to accept, not only for the crowds that gathered, but even for the chosen 12. Still, this was nothing compared to the shock they received next. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus was trying to tell the people that anyone who came to him would have to do so through acceptance of his death and resurrection. That is the basis of salvation. But many of the Jews took his statement literally, and for them, this was too much to take. They were forbidden by the Jewish religion to drink blood, and they were offended by the very suggestion. 
This statement caused most people to walk away from Jesus and it even gave some of them ammunition that they would use against him when he was brought to trial. They missed the point entirely. But in spite of all this, his key followers remained. The apostles had pinned all their hopes on this charismatic teacher known as Jesus, but their dreams were dashed in the darkest hours the world has ever known. Just as he predicted, Jesus was nailed to a cross and died the most shameful and horrifying death imaginable. Through the Gospel accounts, we see the disciples asking Jesus questions about when he would rise up and restore the kingdom to Israel. In spite of Jesus' repeated efforts to help them understand that this was not his reason for being there, the apostles really didn't realize this until his dying moment. They really had not understood, though Jesus had told him, that, that he was going to be killed in Jerusalem. He wasn't coming to take over in Jerusalem. He was coming to die in Jerusalem. Uh, and, and so when that finally happened, it was devastating. And, uh, you know, depression, anger, fear, paranoia, a sense of having all your hopes crushed, cynicism, all of those things surely must have gone through their mind. In fear for their lives, the disciples scattered, and the movement Jesus began seemed to have come to a crushing end. But then, something miraculous occurred. Within a few weeks of Jesus' death, the apostles reemerged into Jewish society. But now they were different, zealous, energized, and with an unwavering passion they became a powerful spiritual force, spreading the message of Christ everywhere they went. What caused this amazing transformation? An event that defied explanation. Jesus literally rose from the dead. Today, billions of Christians around the world base their faith on this core belief. And yet, the Gospel accounts tell us no one was present when this miraculous event occurred. How did the apostles become convinced of the truth of the resurrection? And what about Christians today? Can we be certain the story is true? Could it be that one of the apostles has provided us with evidence that has been overlooked for 2,000 years? And can modern forensic medicine use this information to shed new light on the truth of the resurrection story? Three days after the crucifixion of Jesus, the disciples of Christ were scattered and scared. The body of their leader lay in the tomb, along with all of their hopes for a savior and king. But on that miraculous morning, the first Easter Sunday, the laws of nature were cast aside, and what was once dead was made alive again as Jesus rose from the grave. With this one stunning event, the lives of the 12 apostles and the course of world history would be changed forever. But while Christians accept the story as a gospel truth, there are plenty of skeptics, as well as those who just reject it outright. The question must be asked then, why did the apostles believe in the resurrection? The Bible tells us that no one was in the tomb when the actual event took place, not even Jesus' closest associates. How then did they become so convinced of the truth of the resurrection that they would sacrifice their lives to proclaim it? Perhaps the best place to search for clues to this mystery is with a man who is most often remembered for his doubting nature, the Apostle Thomas. In John chapter 20, all the disciples were devastated. As far as they knew, Jesus was dead, and they got together to comfort each other. Suddenly, Jesus appears to them, and they are overjoyed. Unfortunately, Thomas isn't with them to see this miracle with his own eyes. Thomas wasn't in the upper room because his worst fear had been realized. Jesus was gone, and Thomas was sure he would never see him again. I think that just tore his heart out. He wasn't in a mood to socialize or even share his grief with his friends. He just wanted to be alone. Later, when the other disciples told Thomas they had seen the risen Lord, he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. When people read this story, the first thing they see is Thomas' doubt. But I see the overwhelming grief he felt and the deep devotion he had for his Lord. 
Yes, he doubted the disciples' story, but this feeling came out of his immense sorrow. Keep in mind that all of the disciples were just as grief-stricken as Thomas. Everything they had hoped for, a new kingdom with Jesus on the throne, was now not going to happen. So none of them really believed until they saw the resurrected Jesus. It was just Thomas who said so. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus didn't leave Thomas in his doubt and despair. One week later, he appeared to his disciples again and put all of Thomas's doubts to rest. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. The Apostle John wrote an eyewitness account of what happened in the upper room when Jesus appeared to Thomas and the other disciples. They saw with their own eyes the wounds of the crucifixion in his hands and in his side. Jesus, in fact, invited them to touch his wounds. This was indisputable proof that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was risen from the dead, and that he was the Son of God. As compelling as this story is, skeptics hardly accept it at face value. Yet most scholars agree the apostles must have seen something. Was it actually the resurrected body of the Lord? Or could it be the apostles were mistaken? Since the early 19th century, various critical theories have tried to explain away the resurrection. Uh, one of the favorites that uh, critics have is called the swoon theory, that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, but rather he passed out or he was drugged. And once he got into the tomb, he woke up from the, the damp, cool air. Could it be, as the critics say, that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross? Is it possible that he survived the crucifixion experience and recovered from his wounds? What if the person the disciples saw in the upper room was not the resurrected body of Jesus, but simply the healed body of Jesus? And are there any explanations sufficient to explain the apostles' amazing transformation after the crucifixion? The key to this whole explanation is the dis experience that the disciples had. It's conceded by virtually all scholars that they thought Jesus was alive. They thought they had seen the risen Jesus. Somehow that has to be explained. Because if the resurrection is, as conceded by almost everybody, the center of their faith, then we have to explain why they were so excited, why they're so transformed, why they're so joyous about this event. In short, we have to explain the disciples' experience that they believed to be an appearance of the risen Jesus. Afterwards, the disciples burst on the scene with an exuberance, with a joy. That word comes up over and over again. Something propelled them out into the world. Something caused them to say, hey, we're moving on from this previous point where we kind of got bewildered and fell away. And all of a sudden, they're willing to die for something. I mean, there, there's a question mark here that has to be answered. Something had to have occurred. We know from biblical accounts that after Jesus was taken into custody, many of the apostles went into hiding. But John's Gospel tells us that at least one of the twelve was there to witness the terrible event. The things that John saw at the foot of the cross convinced him that Jesus was in fact dead. But is this simply the emotional account of a subjective witness? Or is there more to John's account than just meets the eye? Could it be that the details provided in John's Gospel may give us a key to verifying that Jesus was not only dead, but the actual cause of his death? And how can modern medicine help us solve this mystery? Dr. Alexander Metherell is an expert on the subject of death by crucifixion and holds a doctorate degree in engineering. More importantly, he's a medical doctor who is board certified in diagnosis by the American Board of Radiology and has been a consultant to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the National Institutes of Health. The Gospels give us some very important information uh, about uh, the cause of death of Jesus. Uh, we know that the Romans gave Jesus a very severe flogging before he uh, took up the cross to go to Golgotha to be nailed to it. This is important because it means that Jesus would have lost a lot of blood even before he was nailed to the cross. 
In other words, he would have been in serious to critical condition medically. And in fact, the descriptions we get from the Gospel accounts indicate that Jesus would have been passing out or fainting and also been extremely thirsty. And this, in, in medical terms, is called hypovolemic shock. The diagnosis of hypovolemic shock brought about by massive blood loss is certainly compelling. But what does this have to do with Jesus' cause of death? Well, the answer lies in a strange piece of information found in the Gospel of John. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. From a medical standpoint, uh, the description in John chapter 19 is important because it perfectly coincides with the medical condition that Jesus went through at that time. The massive blood loss Jesus experienced from the flogging probably led to heart failure and this would have caused a clear fluid to collect in the membrane around the heart and lungs. So when the spear penetrated Jesus' side, it probably went through the lung and into the heart. When the spear was pulled out, the clear fluid that had gathered around the heart, which would have looked like water, came out. This would have been followed by a large volume of blood from the heart. The account given in John's Gospel shows us that it's completely consistent with the medical history. Therefore, we can conclude without any shadow of a doubt that uh, Jesus died on the cross. It's completely impossible for him to have survived that crucifixion. The ravages of a brutal beating, the penetrating wounds of the nails in his hands and feet, and the spear thrust into his side. These are the injuries that undoubtedly seal Jesus' fate and were the same wounds that were revealed to the Apostle Thomas when he saw the risen Jesus. But these are not the only eyewitness accounts found in the New Testament. In a letter the Apostle Peter wrote to some of the earliest Christians, he proclaimed with unwavering certainty, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. The apostles were no doubt convinced of the truth behind the resurrection of Jesus. And as we have seen, modern medical science appears to provide conclusive evidence to verify their story. But perhaps the most compelling testimony can be found in the lives of the apostles themselves. You're talking about men who were running away, scared of their own shadow, quote unquote, before this event, and now they're fearless. They're turning the world upside down, and they're going out, and they're not just saying something happened. I mean, something did, but their explanation is they saw the risen Jesus. And in three of the four Gospels, Jesus is either offering or someone's touching. There's a body there in the words of these uh, writers. And uh, he's standing in front of them. His wounds are intact, and they've seen their friend again. So the, the reason for the joy and exuberance is incredible because Jesus indeed was standing right there with them in a, in a real body. Well, think about the evidence of an eyewitness in a court case. One of the things that you as a juror have to ask is, is there any ulterior motive for this testimony? What does this person have to gain by lying? In the case of the apostles, they had no earthly reward to gain and every earthly comfort to lose, yet they persisted. In fact, they were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming the message of salvation through faith in Jesus without any payoff from a human point of view. No retirement plan, no 401k, no cozy villa waiting for them in Capernaum. They faced a life of hardship. They were ridiculed, beaten, imprisoned. And finally, most of them were executed in tortuous ways. Why? Because they were convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that they had seen Jesus Christ alive. It is difficult, if not impossible, to account for this conviction if, in fact, they had not seen Jesus Christ alive. It's the only explanation that makes sense. Everybody today who dies, dies for an ideology. The fact that you're willing to die shows that you really believe something. But that the disciples were willing to die shows not only that they believed something like everybody else, but that they saw something. And there's the difference. I would think my thoughts about what political party I belong to are not as firm as I saw you in the supermarket yesterday. I'm more sure about that event than I am that I'm holding the right political values. The disciples not only had ideology, they had the event. 
they were sure they saw the risen Jesus. And that alone is something utterly unique because no other founder of the world religions is believed to have been raised from the dead. So they have a unique experience here to talk about and die for. The Apostles of Christ were among a small group of people in history to have known for sure that the story of the resurrected Christ was true. What they did with this knowledge and the power they received from Jesus himself is nothing short of astonishing. The legends and traditions surrounding the Apostles certainly are amazing. But before any of their astounding deeds could be accomplished, the Twelve spent 40 days with the risen Jesus. What happened during this critical time? The New Testament reveals very little about these crucial days, but is it possible that clues to the mystery are hidden in plain sight within its pages? And if so, where might these clues lead us? Jesus of Nazareth, his life, death, and resurrection changed the world forever. But this global transformation began humbly in the lives of 12 ordinary men. Chosen by the Messiah to be his closest companions and emissaries to the world, the 12 apostles lived exceptional lives. In Jesus' name, they preached to countless numbers of people and performed astounding miracles. But they also endured horrendous persecution as well. Crucifixion, beheading, even being sawed in half, these are just a few of the terrible means by which the apostles of Jesus met their fate. In Rome, Peter himself was thrown into a prison dungeon described as the worst the world has ever seen. The only entrance to Peter's dungeon was through a trap door in the ceiling. There were no windows or doors and the dungeon was never cleaned. So the rats and other vermin were always present, ready to eat any food that was thrown down through that trap door. Often they would bite the prisoners and sometimes even eat them alive. Peter spent nine long months in this horrible place, and yet his spirit never faltered. In spite of the squalor in which Peter found himself, tradition tells us that he continually proclaimed to his jailers the glory of God and the way to salvation through Jesus Christ. As a result of his testimony, many of those who were charged with watching over him actually converted to Christianity. Peter's time in the dungeon eventually came to an end when he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. Later church traditions revealed that the apostle considered himself unworthy to suffer the same type of death as Jesus, so he begged the soldiers to crucify him upside down. They willingly obliged. How could Peter and the apostles have endured all that they did in life and in death? Well, the answer may lie in a mysterious period of time that the gospel stories mention only briefly. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, we're told that after the resurrected Jesus showed himself to the apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. These verses raise some of the most intriguing questions in all of Christianity. What exactly did Jesus tell the apostles when he appeared to them? What sort of proofs did he use to convince the apostles that he was the Messiah that they had been waiting for? And can we ever know what really transpired during that mysterious period of 40 days? We know from the first chapter of Acts that Jesus talked to his disciples about the kingdom of God. Undoubtedly, his words were meant to shed light on the teaching about the Messiah written in the Old Testament scriptures hundreds of years before, truths that Jesus himself had fulfilled, yet the disciples had been unable to recognize before the resurrection. In Acts 1, we have this little dialogue between Jesus and the disciples, and they say, okay, now are you going to take over in Jerusalem? Now is the kingdom coming on earth? Now is the Holy Land going to be our land again? And Jesus says, well, it's not for you to know times and seasons about that. Uh, and in fact, what kingdom really means is the divine saving activity spreading from here throughout the earth, saving persons all over the place. That's the dominion of God we're concerned about now. That's the coming of the reign of God on earth that we're concerned about now. Not for you to know the timing when this piece of land is once again going to be Jewish paradise. And so they're, they're sort of rethinking their whole way of relating to kingdom language and being the chosen people and what it means to be faithful to God. Luke chapter 24 reveals yet another clue into the mystery of the 40 days. Here we learn that while two disciples were walking toward the village of Emmaus, Jesus came and walked with them. 
but surprisingly, they didn't recognize him. On the road to Emmaus, the disciples told the stranger about the crucifixion, the empty tomb, and that they didn't know what to make of all that had happened. Jesus chastised them for being foolish and slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken in the Old Testament scriptures. And then the Bible tells us that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. This is perhaps the most specific information we have about what the risen Jesus did during this period of time. He didn't simply send out the 12 disciples into the world without explaining to them what their message was to be. Rather, he took this 40-day period to teach them how he had fulfilled the scriptures and how they were to go out and evangelize the world. At the end of the 40-day period, Jesus gave his disciples a command that has come to be known as the Great Commission. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. How did Jesus expect his disciples, 12 ordinary men, to fulfill this impossible task? We'll enter the realm of speculation now as we talk to the world's foremost experts and ask them some very difficult questions. For example, during the 40 days, did Jesus provide the apostles with a plan for world evangelism? And how did he inspire them to complete the task that he had laid out for them? Is it possible that he showed them a vision of the future, one in which they could see for themselves the fruits of all of their labors? And finally, what drove them into the rest of the world with a message? While there are some questions among biblical scholars, the Apostle John is generally credited with writing five books of the New Testament. The Gospel of John, three letters called 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John records the details of a very dramatic vision of the future he received from God. The vision includes the final judgment of the world by Christ. In Revelation chapter 21, we also find a very specific reference to the Apostles that must have been quite exciting for John to receive. The passage describes a moment when John saw the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That kind of information would have been pretty compelling stuff for the apostles to have when they began their mission of world evangelism. But John received this vision when he was an old man, not when he was just starting out. In fact, the Bible gives us no indication that he or any of the other apostles received a vision of the future early that might have helped or encouraged them. It's just not there. Imagine sitting at the feet of a crucified and risen Savior, and now you're looking at this person in a totally different way. We know a lot of teaching went on in uh, several of the Gospels. We read that in Acts chapter 1 as the writers try to depict this this school, this, this uh, let's say, postgraduate training that the disciples were going through. But I imagine this, this incredible vision that the risen Jesus gives them, says, I'm not gonna be with you, but you men need to take this out there and you need to transform the world with it. And what's sitting back of this is the power that transformed Jesus. And they took that message to the world. If Jesus didn't give the apostles a vision of the future, what directions did he provide for them? In Acts chapter 10, Peter states the answer quite clearly. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. In the New Testament and in traditions passed down through the ages, we find a multitude of examples of how the apostles did exactly as Christ told them. Every move they made seems to have had a singular purpose, to preach the message of Christ openly to all who would receive it. And yet, in spite of this evidence, rumors of a secret knowledge of Christ persist to this day. Is it possible the apostles knew more than they were telling, that they were holding something back for themselves? In the second century, a heretical sect called the Gnostics grew out of this very idea. The Gnostics believed that only a select few were privy to the secrets of Jesus. 
whereas the normal gospel record had to satisfy the rest of the Christian believers. And one of the books to which they point for support is the Gospel of Thomas. In this book, the author quotes Jesus as supposedly saying, I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. According to this text, which most scholars date after the Gospels were written, sometimes long after, Jesus says that his message isn't available to everyone, but only to those who are worthy of receiving that message. To suggest that, you know, if you really want to be in the know, uh, then you need this in addition to whatever else you may be taking in from the teachings of Jesus. And, and that it's really for an elect few or a select few, those who can understand it. So we're on the way to second century Gnosticism, which says you are saved by what you know. Not who you know, but you're saved by how much you know and what you know of this esoteric philosophical religious teaching. And how very different is this from Jesus, the Jewish teacher, who taught in aphorisms, maxims, parables, taught in public, had public dialogue and discourse and debate with Pharisees. This is not knowledge only for the select few. Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth is there for us to know. It is no secret. Jesus revealed it to the apostles during the three years they traveled with him throughout his earthly ministry, and especially during the 40-day period between his resurrection and his ascension. And the apostles have passed that truth on to us. Just as Jesus made it clear to the apostles, so the Bible makes it clear for us today. Jesus is the Messiah who was predicted throughout the Old Testament he suffered and died for the sins of the world. And to receive salvation, we need only believe on that truth. This is the truth that gave the 12 ordinary men their extraordinary courage and unshakable faith. But that isn't all Jesus gave to his followers. Coupled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the disciples became an unstoppable force that changed the world. And almost everywhere they went, miracles happened. The New Testament is filled with amazing stories of miracles performed by the Twelve Apostles, healing the sick, driving out evil spirits, even raising the dead. And the stories become even more fantastic in later church traditions. And one of the more colorful legends associated with the Apostles, Philip is said to have preached in Hierapolis, which is in modern-day Turkey. There the local people worshipped a monstrous serpent. Having compassion on the people, Philip entered the pagan temple and with a cross in hand, commanded the serpent to leave. When the reptile glided out from beneath the altar, the temple was filled with such a hideous stench that many people died, including the king's son. But at the touch of the apostle's hand, the boy was restored to life. Is this amazing tale true or just a legend that sprung up from church tradition? And what are the many other reports of miracles attributed to the apostles? Christians the world over certainly consider the biblical stories of miracles to be reliable. But what about the traditions that exist outside the New Testament? Is it possible to separate fact from fiction after more than 2,000 years? And how did the apostles acquire their miracle working power in the first place? We've all heard it said that miracles happen every day, you just need to know where to look for them. Well, in the case of the Twelve Apostles, you didn't have to look too far. It all began in Jerusalem on a Jewish feast date called the Day of Pentecost, and it occurred some 50 days after the resurrection. When the Day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That profound visitation of the Holy Spirit marked the beginning of astonishing exploits by the apostles, and miracles began to happen immediately. The book of Acts tells us that on the day of Pentecost, there were Jews in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound of the apostles, crowds came together 
and bewilderment, because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. The people were amazed. How could a group of common Galileans be speaking in the language of people from every corner of the world? The Holy Spirit was the key to the Apostles' success, uh, to the expansion of the church, and to the miracles that the Apostles were able to perform. Jesus had told them to wait for the Spirit. And once this dramatic outpouring had taken place, things began to unfold rather quickly. On the same day the Apostles received power from the Spirit, Peter got up to preach. With a large crowd gathered, the man who had denied he even knew Jesus two months earlier delivered a gospel message in such a powerful way that 3,000 people put their faith in Christ that very day. Undoubtedly, some of the people in the crowd were the same people who were calling for Jesus' crucifixion just a few months earlier. And now, here they were, accepting the truth of Jesus as their Messiah. The book of Acts tells us about many of the miracles that happened uh, through the apostles. These included healings, they included uh, release from demons. Even people would come and they would try to get into a place where as the apostle Peter would walk by, his shadow would fall on people and they would be healed. The apostles spoke before crowds of people, including some of the most learned men of Israel. They also experienced miracles that manifested themselves as geophysical events. For example, houses shaking with the presence of the Holy Spirit or the earth quaking in response to their prayers. There were also stories about how the apostles would be imprisoned and angels that God sent would come and open the doors for them so that they could walk free from the prisons. The Bible tells us that after witnessing the miracles of the apostles, thousands of people came to the faith. But other, other sources outside the New Testament that verify these miraculous stories and if they're true, are there other reasons God gave the apostles the power to perform miracles? Throughout history, God revealed Himself to the Jews with signs and wonders. The burning bush, the plagues in Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, to name just a few examples. In fact, the Jews came to expect miraculous signs to demonstrate that someone was a true spokesman for God. Without these miracles, Jesus' message would have had no credibility for the Jews. It follows then that God's main purpose in giving the apostles the power to perform miracles was to give them the credibility they needed to reach a Jewish audience. Any Jew who saw these signs and wonders would have to consider the source of their power and at least listen to their message. While the presence of signs and wonders certainly aided the apostles in their ministry to the Jews, it garnered plenty of attention among the Gentiles as well. Many fascinating stories have emerged from early church tradition that reveal the amazing lives the apostles led and the miracles that followed them as they traveled the world for Christ. According to apocryphal tradition, an attempt was made to silence the apostle John by poisoning him. But through the divine protection of God, John was spared when the poison emerged from the cup in the form of a serpent and slithered away. The apostle Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew, is credited with bringing the gospel to Armenia. There he is said to have performed many miracles, including healing the king's lunatic daughter and driving out a demon that resided within the king's idol. When the demon emerged, his sharp face, fiery eyes, and spiked wings were said to be visible to all. A legend associated with Apostle Matthew claims he raised the son of the king of Egypt from the dead and healed the king's daughter of leprosy. Regardless of the veracity of these particular legends, it seems that the supernatural was present wherever the apostles went. But these signs and wonders also proved to be extremely dangerous. With the power of their message and the miracles that accompanied them, the apostles became a force to be reckoned with in the ancient world. Wherever they went, they stirred things up, and that made them dangerous to the people in power. One of the rulers antagonized by the apostles' activities was none other than the governor of Jerusalem, Herod Agrippa. There is some evidence to suggest that James the Apostle left Jerusalem and traveled all the way across the Mediterranean to Spain to preach the gospel to Jews who were living there. Word of this got back to Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, who was now the Roman ruler of Jerusalem. 
As far as he was concerned, James was preaching a dangerous message that named Jesus, not Caesar, as the King of Kings. When James returned to Jerusalem, he was branded as a traitor to the Roman cause and he was beheaded for inciting rebellion among the Jews in Spain under Roman control. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred. The mission Jesus gave to the apostles was not easy. The gospel brought upheaval everywhere that it was preached. All kinds of kings and rulers considered the apostles and all Christians as a threat and they persecuted them viciously. Like so many of his counterparts, the Apostle Andrew also met his fate at the hands of an angry ruler. Tradition tells us that in the year 69 AD, Andrew traveled to Greece where he led the wife of a provincial governor to Christ. When her husband found out, he ordered Andrew to forsake his faith or he would be tortured fiercely. Andrew refused to recant and instead begged the governor to turn from his sins and embrace the faith to save his own soul. Well, obviously the governor's response was negative because Andrew was first scourged and then tied to an X-shaped cross to prolong his sufferings. He hung upon the cross for two days before he died and during that time he witnessed to every person that passed by about the truth of the gospel. By most historical accounts, 11 of the 12 apostles gave their lives to bring the gospel message to the world. The 12th, the apostle John, is the only one believed to have died of natural causes. But he too endured tremendous persecution in his service to the Lord. Yet in the face of overwhelming hostility and violence, the apostles persevered and the gospel message spread like wildfire. Within 20 years after the be beginning proclamation of the disciples, they took this doctrine, especially the cross and resurrection, from Israel up around the, the Mediterranean world, Eastern Mediterranean world, over to Rome. And we know it's been produced in these regions because of the, the epistles of Paul, the cities he went to, even from extra biblical sources, the death and resurrection of Jesus, especially his death, is the most frequently mentioned event in his life. So the word spread, and it spread very quickly in a short period of time. With the spread of Christianity came increasing persecution and Rome was undoubtedly the greatest offender. Christians were arrested, publicly humiliated, and often tortured to death. Yet somehow, the apostles found a way to overcome their staunchest enemy by turning it into Christianity's biggest supporter. How did this amazing change come about? Did the Roman government unwittingly help the apostles achieve their goal of reaching the world for Christ? And considering all that the apostles accomplished, were they really as ordinary as they seemed to be when Jesus first called them to follow him? The amazing history of the early church is littered with the bodies of believers who were martyred for their faith, and the Roman government was especially zealous in its persecution of believers. They were sentenced to death by the cruelest of means, crucifixion, beheading, and in 64 AD, at the behest of the Roman Emperor Nero, some were even burned alive and used as torches in the streets of Rome. Yet in the year 312, another supernatural event occurred that would bring about an amazing reversal of fortune for the Christians in the Roman Empire and the unprecedented growth of Christianity throughout the world. On the eve of a momentous battle in which his forces were outnumbered, the Roman Emperor Constantine received a vision from God. He saw the cross of Christ superimposed on the sun, and he heard a voice say, In this sign, you will be the victor. On the day of the conflict, Constantine had all of his soldiers put the symbol of the cross on their shields. They went into battle and achieved a stunning victory over the enemy. As a result of this momentous win, the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, and in 313 issued the Edict of Milan which forbid the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire. By the fourth century, Christianity had become the official state religion. All of this is amazing when you consider all the odds against Christianity. It was a religion based on the teachings of a poor carpenter from Nazareth. The leader of the movement was branded a common criminal and executed in the most horrific way possible. He leaves only a handful of followers in the backwater of the Roman Empire to spread his message throughout the known world. 
And yet, in spite of the constant persecution they endured at the hands of Rome, the seed planted by the apostles in the first century continued to grow. By the third century, it's estimated that there were some five million Christians living in the Roman Empire alone. In less than 300 years from the birth of Christianity, the most powerful force in the world, the Roman Empire, was overtaken by it. How could such a miraculous transformation have taken place in such a short period of time? Even the most knowledgeable experts have difficulty explaining exactly how it happened. But there are some intriguing possibilities. Could it be that even prior to Constantine's conversion, the Roman government unwittingly helped the apostles to achieve their goal of reaching the world for Christ? When Jesus began his ministry, the Roman Empire was unquestionably the dominant power in the world. The Romans controlled most of Europe, North Africa, Asia Minor, and of course Palestine as well. Now while the Jews fought against the Roman Empire, the Christians on the other hand benefited from the wonderful highway system which the Romans had set up, which speeded up communications across the entire empire and helped to spread the gospel. While well-established roads and the assurance of safe passage undoubtedly aided the apostles, it can't fully explain their evangelistic achievements. What other forces might have been at work? Modern biblical scholars have put forward another interesting theory to help explain the mystery. For the apostles to have any hope of fulfilling the Great Commission, they had to come up with a, a brilliant evangelistic strategy. From the New Testament accounts, we can piece together something of what that strategy entailed. First, they went to the big cities along the established trade routes and to the port cities where people from all over the world would congregate. They preached to the people there and made many converts. Then these converts traveled out into the small villages and to the far reaches of the globe where they established churches. These churches resulted in many more people hearing the message and in even more churches being established. So in effect, they came up with a way to delegate responsibility and to multiply their numbers more rapidly than anyone ever thought possible. How did the apostles devise this brilliant evangelistic strategy? Well, the search for answers takes us back to the New Testament's most intriguing period of time, the 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension into heaven. One of the things that we presume must have come up during this 40 days is Jesus' initiation of a, of a missionary activity, beginning with that local area and extending to the rest of the world. This is very probable that this is actually part of that instruction for a couple of reasons. Because before the cross, Jesus sent them out more than once. Before the cross, he gives instruction on how to do this. And after the cross, we have probably the most famous comments of Jesus saying basically, go into all the world. So I think we're pretty safe to say a missionary effort is one of the chief legacies Jesus left with his disciples. What we have here is sort of a, uh, maybe an hourglass kind of effect. We have the ministry of Jesus coming down to the cross and from what's traditionally said to be Pentecost on, the disciples are propelled out in the world. The little neck in between these two events are those 40 days where Jesus is saying, take this and go out. And, and I have to think a lot of corrected ideas came during this time. You know, I'm not the king that's going to upset the Romans, not, not this time. Your chief uh, goal is to get people into the kingdom. But you know, there's a lot of teaching going on during this time because they come out with a new purpose, with new ideas, with new focus, and now they get things right. From the leader of the Twelve, Peter, to the most obscure members of the group, like Matthias, the apostles gave their lives in unwavering commitment to the mission Jesus gave them. Were they as ordinary as they seemed, or did they possess hidden traits that only Jesus could see? We may not know a lot about the disciples and who they were before they met Jesus, or even a lot about them after they became his followers. What we do know is that they really weren't powerful rabbis, they weren't political leaders, they weren't extremely wealthy men, uh, nor did they have a great deal of prestige. The only extraordinary thing about these men is that they were ordinary people. They were followers of Jesus and they went out and changed the world. And so it had to do with the power of God working in their lives as ordinary men. 
When we think of the 12 apostles today, we often think of these amazing, larger-than-life saints with shining halos. They seem to exude an exalted degree of spirituality that gives them an otherworldly quality, and that's unfortunate because it dehumanizes them. And it makes it easy to forget that these were 12 ordinary men, chosen for a very specific reason. God wanted to convey a message that even ordinary people are capable of extraordinary things when they're walking in the truth. These men were empowered by God. Everything they did, everything they were able to accomplish, was made possible through Him alone. How incredible and amazing it must have been to walk and talk with the Son of God and to realize the divine power that was coming through your life. What an incredible experience it must have been for those ordinary men. Here were ordinary human beings who had this extraordinary encounter with God in Jesus Christ and were changed forever and in turn were used by God to change the world. They are the least, the last, and the lost that become the first, the most, and the found. And when we look at the end of the gospel story, they go back to being the least, the last, and the lost. They run away. And yet, through the miracle of the Easter events and bestowing of the Holy Spirit once Jesus went away, through these two crucial events, they are galvanized into go for broke, courageous men prepared to go out and tell all the world that the Savior has come. And the truth of the matter is, we also have the ability to be followers of Jesus. We need to remember most of all Jesus' words. You believe, the initial disciples, because you have seen me, and you've seen the miracles, and you've seen all the things that I have done. More blessed, says Jesus, are those who have not seen and yet believe. Well, that's us. Looking back on the amazing story of the apostles, we can't help but wonder if we were in their place, would we be willing to make the same kind of commitment and the same kind of sacrifices to spread the good news? The apostles of Christ died around 2,000 years ago. Yet their lives, their deeds, and their divinely inspired words are as relevant to us today as they were in the days when the story had just begun. They call us to see for ourselves what happened on that first Easter morning, to understand that we too can allow the illuminating knowledge of God's Word to fill our hearts and our minds, and that we can experience that same liberating change that they experienced so long ago. But most importantly, the story of these 12 ordinary men reminds us of the greatest lesson of all, that with God, all things are possible if we only believe.